season 14 gave me big season 12 energy, a season with an iconic group of queens that continuously slayed each week and for the most part were friendly throughout, with a couple exceptions, but it is also a season filled to the absolute brim with rigory. And I think that both of these seasons are examples of how a rigged season can still turn out amazing as long as the producers know the story that they want to tell. And I mean this when I say I want every single queen on this season to return. June Jambalaya, Alyssa Hunter, and Orion Story could kill in early outs season. Maddie Morphosis would be a great wildcard pick for an All-Stars or an international All-Star season. And every single queen that made up the top nine could come back and destroy All-Stars 8 or 9 or 10. This is one of the most talented groups of queens the show has ever seen, with forms and styles of drag that are vastly different and unique. You have queens like Willow and Diabetti and Bosco who have more avant-garde, punky, wacky styles. You have Maddie and Camden and Deja who represent the more campier sides of drag. You have Angeria and Jasmine who are gorgeous, stunning pageant queens. Carrie and June and Alyssa all have a very dynamic and modern style to their drag. I mean, this cast was stacked. And even the early outs could have made it super far on a different season. So I'm really excited to just break this season down because I really enjoy talking about seasons that I love. And this is a season I absolutely love. And I'm saying all this because I want to make it clear how much I love this season and all of the queens on this cast before I start to break it down and talk about the things that I felt were rigged. And honestly, the end result was so perfect that I don't mind a single decision on this season that was rigged, except for one, but we will get there. Before we dive into the season, let's take a look at the cast and some of the queens who came in with a clear advantage. We've seen it time and time again that being in the same drag family with former drag race royalty definitely can give you a boost when it comes to production. There's already an easy way to introduce you to the audience and give them a reference point to who you are and what kind of drag you do. Willow Pill and Diabetti for sure come in with a slight edge due to being related to Evie Oddly and Crystal Method. And this family dynamic is brought up many times throughout the season with both of them. Coming in, the actually the only other queens I think had a slight advantage are Cornbread and Carrie. I mean, they were the only queens who I knew about and followed prior to this season being cast. And Carrie comes from a legendary house, that being the legendary house of Colby. Sasha Colby is a huge, huge drag name. Despite never being on Drag Race, she's one of those queens that kind of is bigger than Drag Race. And so because of that, Carrie has had a big following on Instagram even before the season started filming. And Cornbread also had a pretty big following, being featured on the season 13 reunion episode. And I've seen her in some other online content. So yeah, I've heard of both of these queens before. And I definitely think that some of these factors led into them being probably early favorites for production. They have the dynamic personalities and top tier drag. So it's no question that production definitely at least had their eyes on them coming into the season. What's weird though, and we can talk about this as we go along, is that none of the four of these queens were pushed on the season. Usually I'll talk about the queens that production probably had their eyes on coming in, and those are the queens that get the biggest push from production. This season, it's actually the opposite. I mean, you could say that Cornbread possibly could have been pushed further on if she had lasted longer, but we saw them give her a low placement already in the few episodes she was in. So really, none of these queens in my eyes were getting any favorable treatment by production. The queens who, in my opinion, get the most favoritism from production were Bosco, Georges, and to like a lesser extent, Lady Camden. I think Camden and Bosco's personalities and Georges' performance ability and, you know, the fact that she was born to do drag... <laughs> Definitely cued production in on them. 
And when they all make great TV right off the bat, it's no wonder why they quickly became favorites by production. Before we dive into the season episode by episode, I wanted to point out two videos that I've posted about the season already. One where I discussed the weird pacing throughout the season and the multiple non-elimination episodes, and then one on the chocolate bar twist. I'm going to mostly gloss over everything I've already discussed in those videos here, but if you haven't seen them, I'll throw them in the top right corner where I think you should watch them. The pacing one I think is good to watch right after we hit Cornbread's elimination, and the chocolate bar one you can just watch right after we talk about Bosco getting the golden chocolate bar. So that's all the notes I have. Let's dive into the rigory of season 14. So our first two episodes of the season are the talent show. And while I love splitting the cast and not losing anyone in the first two episodes, I feel like this could have been done better. We've seen it been done better. The talent show performances all felt small compared to some of the ones we see on All Stars. And that makes sense because these queens don't have the budget that the All-Stars queens have. But a lot of these performances ended up feeling somewhat the same, or at least in the same vein. I mean, Angeria and Cornbread and Georges and Jasmine and Camden and Daya and Alyssa all did variations of a lip sync performance. And a lot of the people that did something different ended up in the bottom, like the Dejas and Orions and June and Maddie. Not saying that those weren't deserved, it just wasn't the greatest talent show I've ever seen, and it wasn't the greatest variety of acts that we have seen on the show. Cornbread and Willow absolutely demolish the first episode and became quick fan favorites in the process. Bosco and Carrie also have fun performances, but Alyssa commits the cardinal sin of the talent show when she does a talent that doesn't brand herself or what her drag style is right off the bat. And I mean, we see the producers basically throw her to the wolves after this episode. So it's hard to say that her hiccup in this episode doesn't have something to do with that. I mean, the bottom three of the first episode are also the first three queens to leave, with the fourth to leave being one of the bottoms from the second premiere. So I definitely think the producers looked to see who really stood out in this talent show and showed their personalities and their brands and definitely factored that into who they saw as main contenders for most of the season. Besides Cornbread, for obvious reasons, the top six queens from the talent show all make it to the end game of the season. I always say that the first couple of episodes of a season usually aren't rigged too much so that the producers can see who naturally stands out and then they can go from there. So neither of these premieres are rigged, with the one exception being Georges. Her and Jasmine both do virtually the same performance, lip syncing to a song that's not theirs, dancing, and doing stunts. Now, both do a really great job, but in the critiques, Georges gets the slight negative critique for starting off a little too slow and taking a little too long to get into, like, the meat and potatoes of her talent show, while Jasmine got positive critiques across the board. Then, when it came to placements, Jasmine is deemed safe, and Georges is given a spot in the top and gets special recognition from Rue. And this is nothing major, but given how much favoritism Georges is going to get throughout the season, I wasn't shocked to see like little things like this happen right off the bat. I mean, even putting Georges right before Jasmine in the order of the talent performances was a little bit shady. So let's move on to the pair of balls episode. You know, if there's one thing about this show, they will make a ball pun whenever they can. They will take every opportunity and it will always be a little bit cringe. So this episode was wild to me, <laughs> critiques wise. I remember watching it and having a pretty clear idea of who I thought would be in the top and who I thought would be in the bottom. And I was completely wrong. When I watched, my initial thoughts were, Surely this win is going to Angeria or Alyssa, right? I mean, both of their first two looks were absolutely stunning and gorgeous. And their third looks, 
the ones that they made themselves fit the brief of bridal and looks like they literally could have just brought it from home. For Alyssa to just be safe in this episode was absolutely criminal. Her looks were all incredibly fashion, well-constructed, and had a clear voice and concept. I can see why she was so upset in Untucked and in the following episode because she was just safe. To create one of the most stunning garments of the season, only to be deemed safe while one of the top looks didn't even fit the bridal brief whatsoever, Justice for Alyssa Hunter. I will scream this from the mountaintops if I have to. She truly deserved better. I literally thought Georges was going to be in the bottom three when she was called for critiques. While her Ariana Grande look was absolutely stunning, she did have like a little fashion faux pas for half the runway while wearing it. And her first and third looks, I felt, didn't fit their prompts whatsoever. Her Red Hot Resort look was more like a 1970s disco club look. And her bridal couture wasn't bridal at all. Instead looking like what Katy Perry would wear while performing firework on tour. I wouldn't say Georges was one of the worst of the night or anything, but there were plenty of other queens who I felt looked gorgeous in all of their looks while also fitting the brief as well. In fact, this season has so many episodes where half or more of the cast does a phenomenal job in the challenge that we can kind of take a look at each group of those queens every episode. So these are the six that I feel did the absolute best in this challenge. Again, this is just my opinion, but I felt that they had the most consistent, clear visions for all of their looks of the group. But I have to say, at first, I was not fully on board with a Willow Pill win here, just because... In the moment, I thought Angeria and Alyssa did better overall. But I will say, Willow's final bridal look has won me over with time. I wasn't the biggest fan of it when I first saw the episode, but after hearing people discuss it and seeing it a lot, I have for sure come on board with enjoying it as much as everyone else has. It's very fashion, and it somehow still reads bridal while looking different from everyone else on the runway. Now, for the bottom three, we have Orion, June, and Maddie. Now, I had the complete opposite happen with Maddie that happened with Willow for me. I originally was shocked to see Maddie in the bottom. I didn't think that her bridal look was stellar by any means, but I thought that the reference was funny and she performed the character well on the runway. But, you know, looking back now, I definitely think that there were tweaks that could have been made to all three of her looks to improve them. But I still disagree with the critique about her red hot resort look when they said it was basic. I mean, she made this entire outfit herself. How are you going to call it basic and then not say a word about Georges's red hot resort look? Orion, I thought she was going to be in the top. <laughs> like I said, everything I thought was going to happen in this episode, it didn't happen. So she showed her specific style of drag, I thought, so well in this challenge. She managed to mix her vintage aesthetic super well with the animal print prompts while also making it feel modern. And her wedding gown maybe didn't read wedding completely, but if Georges can get married in a half-naked performance gown, why can't Orion get married in a Peg Bundy realness gown? And they called Orion's looks busy, but they were fine with these. I just wasn't featuring this a lot. But I feel like Orion and Alyssa were both not on the producers' radars for queens that they wanted to go far in the season. So they each got knocked down a peg from where they probably deserved to be in this episode. Another queen who I thought got somewhat of a pass this episode was Carrie because um, <laughs> I thought this look was a little struggle bus. But June Jambalaya goes home, and it's sad we didn't get to see more of her runways because, you know, even if she didn't last super long on the season, I still looked forward every week to see what she was going to post on her Instagram for the runways. So many of these were fully, fully standouts and would have been so great to see 
on the actual show. But um, let's move on to the Super Tease episode, one of the best episodes of the season, in my opinion. This is where we get Cornbread versus Jasmine, one of the greatest challenges of the season, Carrie's iconic J-Lo dress. This is for sure the episode where everything started clicking for me, and I saw this blossoming into an all-time great season. Now, lots of queens do amazing in this episode. Camden, I thought, was so funny playing an American. Bosco being like a coked-out ditz. Diabetti being straight. But the two standouts of the episode were 100% Deja and Angeria. They both have so many fun moments, both together and separately, that either one of them could have been given the win. But I'm not shocked to see it was Angeria who won it in the end. I mean, she is such a superstar from the very moment she walked into the workroom. And I think that was obvious to everyone there and to all of us watching at home. Making her an early front runner, honestly, it just makes sense. And she looked gorgeous on the runway. So why not give her a second win right off the bat? After the edit kind of undermined Deja in the episode prior, where she talks about how she's a seamstress, she's excited for the ball challenge, only then for the queens to kind of shade her final look, it was nice to see her get some flowers here, finally. Something very interesting about this episode, though, is I think we get a closer look at how production can interfere with the results of a challenge. So when they're recording this maxi challenge the queens look like they have to do a ton of shit like they have to make so much content for these super teases and a lot of it gets left on the cutting room floor but by comparing what we saw them do in the recording and then what made the final cut it's very telling the things that were chosen to remain in the super teases definitely paint a picture i think of who production likes and who production was ready to get rid of Maddie Morphosis is given a pretty solid redemption arc in this episode with multiple members of her team telling us what a great leader she was and how her ideas and organization really are what led to their teaser being as great as it was. Then we see this hilarious moment during the recording, which Carson and Michelle both call out for being very smart and very funny. I grew up in a very like, liberal family, and when I came out as straight... My dad's disowned me. But then when it comes time to watch the teasers, this scene is nowhere to be found. Maddie's part is actually cut out, and it just starts with Daya's response to her. Now, if they wanted to, they could 100% have justified putting Maddie in the top this episode. I mean, this is one of the best moments out of the entire teaser. The dancing queen is here. And I think it would have been a great storyline for her. I mean, she has funny moments. She is being a great team leader. And all the positive content she had been getting all episode could have led to a very solid high placement for her and some momentum moving forward. But let's just be real. But I just don't care about Maddie Morphosis. The outcry of Maddie taking up a spot in such a queer space was all over the headlines coming into the season. I mean, RuPaul's Drag Race, cast first straight queen, was everywhere. And Twitter rants were going on, and Reddit threads were going crazy. But I think that Maddie proved to everyone that she is not ignorant to queer issues, and uses her platform to raise awareness and start discussions on them. That and her hilarious social media presence <laughs> managed to get the fandom on her side by the end of the season, I just wish we could have seen her kind of harness those comedic chops that she is constantly showing on her Twitter and her TikTok and do that on the show because I think she definitely could have gone far. Now, they left out Maddie's scenes to keep her just safe, but I think they left out some Georgia scenes to keep her out of the bottom. Now, this is the third week in a row where Georgia gets some favoritism. And this is one of the more blatant examples of it, in my opinion. Georgia's storyline this entire episode is how she's nervous for the comedy challenges since her friends back home have told her she wasn't going to do well at them. 
and it has psyched her out ever since. So during the recording, she has some very cringy moments. She has a scene with Bosco that falls completely flat. The fits into one ho ho. And Michelle and Carson are very clearly not featuring anything she is doing. But then, if you look at the final product, that scene is nowhere to be found. And Georges is barely in the super tease, having like three lines in the entire thing. It's very clear to me that they hid Georges in the final edit to avoid putting her in the bottom here. But I actually think this would have been a great storyline for her. She talks about how she's such a massive JLo fan, so slaughtering a JLo lip sync would have been a pretty satisfying conclusion to this episode. Instead, we see Carrie in the bottom, and it seemed like the storyline that Georges was discussing, they instead gave to Carrie during the critiques. Carrie absolutely was in her head during the recording process, but watching the final product, Carrie had a clear character, nailed all of her lines, and had one of the best parts of her teaser with her mirror moment. I am so sorry, girl, that you are not me. Paired that along with her wearing an actual JLo dress on the JLo runway, she should have been fine here. Instead, I think they put her in the bottom, probably thinking she's going to eat up this lip sync since she did so well in the talent show and send home Alyssa, who they truly could give a fuck about. And instead, she can barely lip sync since she's so terrified of ruining this dress, which, I mean, valid. But so what we get instead is a sugarcane moment where Carrie didn't deserve to be in the bottom, but she 100% lost the lip sync after. When they said, Carrie, Shantae, you stay, my jaw dropped. I was so confused. Sure, Alyssa had some technical difficulties with her money gun, but I mean, she ate up every other moment of the lip sync. It gave me very Ariel Versace, sorry for all these season 11 flashbacks, but Ariel nailed every single moment of that lip sync except her fall. But because of that one mistake, she was sent home over someone who had a subpar performance overall. Alyssa Hunter fell prey to the same poor treatment a lot of other ESL queens over the years have. The second they struggle to keep up with remembering lines or keeping up with pronunciation, they're edited to look like a flop and immediately sent home. And it's just a fact that ESL queens come in at a disadvantage, some more than others, and there's definitely things the show could do to aid them, like being more patient with them during recordings, like in this episode, or, you know, not making them out to look dumb and crazy every single time. I'm very happy that the conversation about ESL Queens is starting to come to light a little bit more, especially after this episode with Alyssa, because I think it's definitely one of those drag race blind spots that is still happening where it's like, how are you about to pull this over and over again? And I just think that they deserve better, and I hope that the show does better moving forward. Unlike Georges, whose worst material was left out of the final product, Every single one of Alyssa's moments that fell flat were left in. And then she gives one of the best runways of the episode, and then she nails the lip sync, and she's still sent home. I'm not trying to say Alyssa didn't deserve bottom two here or anything, but there's a definite double standard here between ESL queens and non-ESL queens. Georges can give a cringy performance, and they just edit it out to make her look better. Alyssa gives a cringy performance and they leave every single moment in to highlight just how bad she was and kind of poke fun at her. Some say Alyssa was robbed. I say that we were all robbed of seeing her runways on the main stage throughout the season. All right, save a queen, another banger of a challenge, another banger of an episode. We get the same kind of deal as last episode where something we see Maddie Morphosis do in the recording didn't make the final cut. They purposely use a worse take of her line reading in the final product than we saw her do in the recording. Michelle tells her to add some sass, which she does. She nails it, 
but then they play the version where she didn't add any inflection. She really thought she could compete with these bitches. Cut. That's a keeper. She really thought she could compete with these bitches. Again, these hoes don't give an absolute fuck about Maddie Morphosis, and this is the week where she had an absolutely flawless and top-tier runway to go along with a great performance in the challenge, but in a week where, again, so many queens did well, they had to pick and choose. Ashley agreed with every placement this week, but we can still talk about some of these edits and storylines. This episode is the start of Lady Camden's domination of episodes 5 to 7. She's in the top, but Michelle points out that her timid nature is going to cost her in the competition. Funny that her first challenge win is when she bursts into the room screaming, My obscene! Georges is finally put into the bottom, but it's only when the queen she's up against they've already seen lip sync, and no will be an easy win for Georges. I honestly feel so bad for Orion. She gets the delusional edit this episode, and of all the queens this season, I feel like Orion got the roughest deal. She's barely in the edit, and when she is, it's not her looking her best. Even at the reunion, she got barely any content, and she turned out some stunning looks as well that we didn't get to see on the runway. I mean, I can already see her glow up on Instagram, so I feel like Orion is a shoe in to come back and slay in an early out season in the future. So next we have the Glamazon Prime episode. And I already somewhat talked about this in my What the Fuck Challenge Wins video, but Georgia's winning this was insanity. <laughs> it was absolute insanity. We don't need to harp on it any longer, but it's a piece of fabric. So many queens did so well this episode. Yes, I know, that's a running theme. Daya could have won. Camden could have won. But Georges, I mean, I, I don't understand. If you ask me, Carrie, Jasmine, and Maddie had the three worst looks of this episode. Carrie, my queen, you didn't deserve bottom two for the super tease, but you deserved it here. <laughs> At least with Jasmine and Maddie, I know what they're going for. I don't even know what this is. Deja gets put in the bottom three instead, though, because they don't like her props, but they saw nothing wrong with the random things just attached to a bodysuit. Carrie had a very strange journey on this season. She was in seven episodes, and she was safe for five of them. One time, she's in the bottom. It's not deserved. Another episode, she should have been in the bottom. She's just safe. And the episode she's eliminated, I think also is a kind of questionable bottom placement for her. Carrie's storyline for much of the season is that she's too afraid to do anything other than just look pretty. And that is what is holding her back in the competition. And I know that it is a tried and true storyline to give to a pretty queen, but I just don't see it for her. I actually think she did fine in all of the acting or comedy challenges that she was in. The only time she really struggled in my eyes is when she had to sew something. Georgia's very much was the girl who struggled with being anything other than pretty, but like I said in the Super Tease episode, they decided to give that arc to Carrie instead, and for the rest of her time on the show, she's trying to prove to the judges that she can do ugly. I mean, she did her old lady bit in Save a Queen, she did the Spring Runway, but that doesn't make her stand out enough to get a spot in the top regardless. I actually think the challenge she 100% could have won is the drag con challenge because something about listening to Carrie Colby talk, it's like she casts a spell on my soul and suddenly I'm at peace and everything in the world is fine. From her talking about her childhood and coming out as a trans woman to her just goofing off with the other queens in the workroom, no one on this cast quite has the eloquence and draw that Carrie does. And just like Maddie, I wish she was able to harness that power into the challenges. I mean, she is Tranos. The power that she holds is insurmountable. I really do see Carrie coming back and demolishing an all-star season, especially now that she can just look back and see what we all saw in her the whole time. Carrie was like that last queen to go before we have our main eight queens of the season, 
But these early episodes with Carrie all feel so much more dynamic and fun just by having her be our narrator. Anyways, I could sing the praises of Carrie Colby all night and day, but let's move on. Maddie hits the hay in this episode, which is sad because she had really nailed the previous two episodes, but hadn't really been given her moment to shine from it with the judges. She does basically the same thing she did in the last design challenge, doing a kind of stereotypical hillbilly storyline on the runway. At least she went out in iconic fashion because I will never, ever forget Daddy Morphosis for as long as I live. If I had one critique about these first few episodes, it's that it makes the front runners very, very obvious. Of the 18 top placements so far, 14 of them have been given to the same four queens, Angie, Willow, Georges, and Camden. And obviously that's because they're all doing so well. But, like, they could have thrown Maddie a high placement. They could have thrown Angie, they, they could have thrown Alyssa a high placement in the ball, or Diabetti. I mean, I do feel like there is a hierarchy of queens that is made very apparent very quickly. Whereas, if we compare it to season 12 by episode 6, 10 out of the 14 queens had a moment in the top. Even though Gigi, the dessert one, and Jackie had a lot of top placements, it still felt like the other queens all got moments to shine as well. Luckily, we do get Daytona Wind next, which is an episode where literally every queen does a good job. And we get some really great moments for Jasmine and Diabetti to shine. And none for Carrie Colby Bye. Another instance of a queen's best work getting cut out of the final product. Tester! I know. That is what I just told them. <laughs> Bosco, Willow, and Camden were it for me this episode. Their performances and the challenge, their runways, any combination of them in the top two works for me. Daya was a lovely third alternate in my eyes. But for storyline purposes, Daya being in the top two here makes total sense, and I'm not even mad about it. I have been a Daya stan from day one. When the trolls were sending her death threats online, I was reposting her iconic looks to my Insta story. We are not the same. Her style of drag is just, I think, way more up my alley and to my personal taste than what, like, Angeria or Carrie Colby does. So I've always gravitated more towards the weird, wacky forms of drag. I mean, like, Evie and Milk and Thorgy are some of my all-time favorite queens. So Daya fit perfectly in with that group, and I appreciated everything she was doing throughout the season. I was, uh, beyond irritated when Daya's main story after being eliminated in episode one was that she looked like Crystal Method. But, like, no tea... How many queens do a vaguely similar pretty girl fashion face and no one will ever compare them? It's like when Michelle told Crystal on season 12 that she needed to switch up her makeup in episode 1. After she was the only queen in that episode to switch up her makeup at all. It's one of the most frustrating things about Drag Race to me, how Rock'em Sakura is told she looks like Trixie and Kimchi, despite having a very distinct shape to her makeup, and Daya being chastised for painting like her drag mom. Daya was this season's villain, and I was happy that unlike the last few villain edits we've seen with the Vixen and Raja O'Hara and Gia Gunn, that instead of knocking them all down a peg and humiliating them on the way out, instead, they build Daya into a legitimate threat in the competition. But notice, it wasn't until Daya was really hammering it in on her shady diary rooms and rolling her eyes every five seconds that she's given any room in the top whatsoever. If they wanted, they could have justified Diabetti with a top placement in the ball, or the Glamazon Prime challenge, but now her storyline picks up steam and she's put in the top two and praised by the judges once she starts giving the producers exactly what they want from her. Also, I just want to mention that another slight Georges favoritism happens. They easily could have swapped Carrie and Georges this episode. 
Carrie did some amazing facial acting with her expressions, and despite not having a huge part, I thought she did well with what she had, as well as actually wearing chaps on the chaps runway. But let's move on to the 60s girl group challenge. One of my favorite performances of the entire season was Daya, Willow, and Bosco doing Bad Boy Baby. They were the only group that took any risk whatsoever with this challenge. And Bosco has continuously taken big risks this season. Her choice to play a character completely different from everyone else in Save a Queen snagged her the win. Her Ditz character really paid off in Super Tees. She went for a daring silhouette and color combo in the Glamazon Prime challenge that turned out gorgeous. And now she leads the pack with these stupid but hilarious lyrics for this girl group challenge. While everyone else is just writing like generic 60s lyrics about liking a cute boy and whatever, Bosco leads her team here writing some of the funniest lyrics we have ever heard on the show. And obviously Daya and Willow for sure helped, but you could tell this was the brainchild of Bosco. Her humor is literally all over this thing and I loved every second of it. I wish this had been judged like the girl group challenges are on the UK because Daya, Bosco, and Willow were so clearly the best group by far, despite Angeria and Deja both being standouts in their respective groups as well. They took a big swing with Bad Boy Baby and it paid off. I get why Daya won solo. She had the best performance of the three. Willow looked a little low energy, and Bosco could have given it a little bit more in the performance aspect as well. But really, it was such a standout performance. Just give them all the win. We can talk about Angeria, Camden, and Carrie's team. I am ready. I'm prepared. I have mentally prepared for the Camden stands to come for me. Just like the Rosé stands did, and just like the Gigi stands did the last two seasons, Camden was deservedly low in this challenge. And Carrie did better than bottom two. There, I said it. But Camdenistas don't click off yet because I promise you will love what I have to hear about the Snatch Game. Something about Camden's hair and makeup and her mannerisms here were just so weird. Like, she looked like an 80-year-old woman. Maybe that's what she was going for, but it was very odd to watch, and it stood out to me for all the wrong reasons. Pair that with her runway that just didn't meet the level that she had been hitting the last couple weeks. I think a low placement was a lovely place for her this week. To me, this should have been the Georges and Jasmine bottom two. Jasmine was stiff in the performance, and Georges literally had to do her part of the song's spoken word since her singing was so off-key. Carrie is given the critique that she went to gospel with her performance, and I do get that, but I still think that her performance was better than Camden and George's and Jasmine's. But we lose Carrie, I was very sad, and we move on with our main cast of the season, our final eight, we were with them for 500 episodes, <laughs> so let's move on to the DragCon panels. And I think that adapting this challenge to fit the more Pink Table Talk-esque vibe than the way that they did it on season 10 worked a lot better. It really forces the queens to share who they are with the world under all of the makeup and all of the glam, which is really what makes the fans fall in love with you. The hardest part of this challenge is finding that sweet spot where you have emotional moments, but also have funny moments. And to me, four queens really hit the nail on the head there. Bosco, Angie, Willow, and Deja were the clear standouts of this challenge, with Deja's team being the clear better of the two. The problem with the judging this episode is that not all the queens are on the same playing field, because you have Deja and Bosco, who are the moderators, and it's their job to keep the pace and the flow of the panel going smoothly while also making sure all their teammates shine. While I think Bosco was tied with Willow as the funniest queen this episode, and she shared some really emotional moments as well and insightful ones, I do somewhat feel like her winning this challenge was off. I'm going to compare it to Ginger Minj 
winning the Pink Table Talks on All Star 6, which I felt similarly about. Both Ginger and Bosco nailed the balance of emotion and hilarity, but when it came to their role as moderator, it felt like they somewhat let their teammates down. While Deja chimed in after letting her teammates have their moments and setting up the next topic, sometimes Bosco, I felt, would interject and steal the spotlight a little bit, which is fine because this is a competition and she wants to do well, but I do feel like Deja managed to nail the role as moderator while also having her funny or emotional moments as well. Personally, I would have just given the win here to Willow Pill. I mean, she had so much great content that they were showing extra clips of it in Untucked. Like, here's more Willow content because she was just doing so well. She had some of the funniest jokes of the night, but also had some great insights on gender politics and details of her home life. And I've seen the argument that Willow's this is just one of those episodes where everyone but the bottom two did well. So it felt weird to shove Diabetti into a low spot just because they needed one. Especially since she got all positive critiques and then suddenly they're like, oh, Diabetti, you're low. I wish they would have just put Angie in the top and then have an extra high placement and then no low placement. The bottom two was obvious regardless. So we have... Georges versus Jasmine, the two lipstick assassins, and we get the double Shantae since they can't use the chocolate bar twist this early. But it was clear from all of the polls coming out after this episode, here's the one I ran on my story, that Jasmine won this lip sync. But there's no way Rue was ready to get rid of Georges. And we need eight queens for this Lala Perusa twist coming up, so let's just get right into snatch game i really don't want to talk about it too much i discussed it a little bit in this video where i ranked the snatch games in a very terrible fashion thank you all for the comments pointing out how terrible it was but this episode really was a giant brick wall in the middle of a great season we drove into that wall at maximum overdrive i mean this was rigged the whole thing they needed to justify the Lala Perusa, so they needed a challenge where every queen but one would flop, and the one challenge that is the easiest to guarantee maximum floppage is Snatch Game. In a commercial challenge, or an acting challenge, or a design challenge, there's always going to be standouts, because the queens are left to their own devices. This is the one challenge where Rue has direct influence on the outcome of events. Queens have said time and time again that Snatch Game is the most nerve-wracking part of Drag Race, and all it takes is Rue not laughing at one of your jokes to throw you off your game. Rue starts out laughing at everyone as he introduces them, but then once he starts asking the questions, he stops laughing completely. Except at Deja, who he laughs at every single time she opens up her mouth. There are jokes here that Rue would cackle at in any other Snatch game. Mischievous as a midnight puck, Prince Harry loves a good fairy tale. But by not volleying with the queens and instead just giving them like a deadpan look, he knows it's going to throw everyone off their game and cause them all to tank. If Rue isn't laughing and playing along, what are you supposed to do other than just flounder? Deja, Camden, Bosco, and Georges all had jokes that could have landed and could have kept them out of the bottom on any other season. Angeria literally said on Instagram that many of her Tammy references never made the air, which makes her critique that she didn't use any references not make any sense. It's obvious, based on what the Queens have said, that there's more to explore <laughs> behind the scenes of what happened here, and maybe we'll find out what happened one day. This episode was rigged before it even started filming, and it really is a shame that a season with such talent and so many episodes where like half the cast is destroying the challenges that they would go and make them all look like flops then. I'm not saying this was the funniest Snatch Game ever, and they edited it to look horrible, I'm saying that all the things that Rue usually does to bring out the funny moments in a Snatch Game, he deliberately doesn't. And a Room of Silence only makes for a worse end result. 
Deja gets her first win here, and it is very well deserved. The storyline for her had been building for a few weeks now. It seemed like she was always doing well and always in the top, but she could never stick the landing. Well, here, she really gets propped up as like a juggernaut in the Snatch game, and given the flowers that she's been kind of teased throughout the season. I wonder if Deja's more low-key edit was meant to kind of build to this moment. Sort of like the silent underdog who lip-syncs in episode one and then continues to get better and better every week and picking up momentum before finally being top dog in episode 10 and then just getting to sit out episode 11, getting a free ride to episode 12. The problem is... Deja gets so little screen time in the first half of the season that I don't think the storyline paid off as well as production had hoped. If Deja had gotten the material that Willow and Angeria and Carrie and Bosco were getting every week, where we get to know them as people, get to know their opinions on things, hear their stories, and know their relationships with the other girls, this win for Deja would have been a gigantic moment where the fandom all rally around her and celebrate that moment. And while that still did happen, I just know if she had been used in the narrative more often throughout the season, it could have been so much bigger. And she deserves that. She is a stunning queen and showed what a genuine kind soul she is on the show. I just wish we got to see it more. Lala Perusa is also so rigged it hurts. And I hope I taught you guys well, because when they bring out that, like, bingo thingy-mabobber with all the balls in it, Calix, the pit crew member, literally, like, he looks into it. He looks into the bingo machine while he's picking up a ball, and they all have giant initials on them. So, like, he knows who he's supposed to pick, and it, they didn't even try to hide it. Like, he is literally looking into the machine. So Jasmine gets to go first. She picks Daya because, well, Daya has lost two lip syncs and, of course, storyline. Willow then gets to pick the next ball because she's motherfucker Willow Pill. It's predictable. <laughs> it's exactly what you would expect to happen, right? Two queens getting to choose who they want to lip sync against for completely different reasons, but it's reasons that make sense with their storylines and with the overall narrative of the season of... Jasmine wants to get out Daya, and Willow is the silent strategist that no one sees coming. Also, like, let's just take a look at the list of songs that they have to choose from. It's a very, like, weird assortment. I mean, for the Lip Sync Smackdown on All-Star 6, they had all these, like, crazy fun songs. Like, Girls Just Want to Have Fun, Song for the Lonely, Heartbreaker, Focus, Barbie Girl. And on All-Stars 4, they had all of these fun RuPaul songs. This very much feels like there were a lot of slower songs or like lower tempo songs because this would benefit more of the queens on the cast and the ones that are more like underdogs in this type of challenge. I mean, if they just had like pop bangers, Jasmine and Georges and Camden would annihilate everyone. But with these slower songs, it allows people like Bosco and Willow and Daya to have a fair shot. Jasmine, I mean, shockingly goes home on a lip sync episode where that is literally the thing that she is the best at. But is it that shocking? I mean, she's the only queen left without a win. She's been in the bottom the last three episodes, and not a single song on this list seems like it's up her alley, which is the more bucking and stunting and fast-paced kind of lip sync style. I have to admit... After these two episodes felt so heavy-handed with the production tampering, I was worried for how the rest of the season would go. But luckily, we get a banger of an episode, and the only rusical so far to give Madonna the rusical a run for its money. This felt like another episode that didn't need to have a low placement, Everyone did an amazing job, even the bottom two. In another season, those bottom two would be safe. They just weren't as stellar as everyone else. But Deja gets put in the low placement mostly for her runway. And that big storyline we just talked about with Deja just sort of deflates immediately. 
she's relegated to a supporting character to the narrative again and kind of bows out the following week while the show focuses on its main characters again. The chocolate bar twist happens. Go watch the video on that. Bosco gets another chance and we move on to the roast where Bosco absolutely smashes it. I think Bosco's humor is something everyone doesn't get, but I love like a dry wit. So I really, really think she is hilarious. Her, Willow, and Camden slay the roast while Daya, Deja, and Georges all struggle. And because they had way too many non-elimination episodes, now they have to force a double elimination just to get to the finish line in time. Diabetti, of course, smashes it to an Olivia Rodrigo song, a song right up her alley, and suddenly we're at the top five. It felt like, wow, we can't send these bitches home fast enough, and now suddenly it's the end. Ever since Cornbread left, the narrative has been building up the friendship between Angeria and Willow, and it all pays off in this episode where they have to lip sync against each other and send one of them home right before the finale. It's heartbreaking to watch these two best friends do this to each other right before the finale, except, nope, we are going to have a top five. I actually don't mind the top five finale, but production definitely shot themselves in the foot by putting their two fan favorites against each other like this at the very last minute. Angeria started off the season in the top five weeks in a row, but it did feel like she was losing steam towards the end of the season. She had been safe since the girl groups challenge and that fire that was in her eyes during the first few weeks just wasn't there anymore which is valid because they've been doing this for like 17 months now, but her bottom placement here does feel justified. Willow's, on the other hand, not so much. Willow has been the heart and soul of the season since the very first episode, just like Jinx and Evie before her. She's somewhat seen as the underdog, despite doing super well every single week. I mean, I saw Willow as the winner of the season, the very first time I saw her drop spaghetti into a bathtub. And the only challenge out of all 5,000 that they did this season that she struggled in was Snatch Game. So it felt like putting her here in the bottom, despite her doing super well in the Rumix, it felt kind of cruel, especially since it was against her best friend left. We know that they both made it to the finale and everything is fine, but they did film endings where both of them are sent home. So it just felt unnecessary to do to the two biggest breakout stars of the season. Lady Camden wins this challenge and um, listen, I don't see it. I have heard a lot of talk that a lot of other people don't see it, but her runway was gorgeous and her dancing was lovely. They don't even get into critiquing the actual verses that the queens wrote themselves, probably because Willow and Daya had the best two, and they had to justify Willow in the bottom and Camden winning over Daya. I really thought this was Daya's episode for the taking. After being in the bottom the week prior and sending two lip sync assassins home, it would have been nice to see her snag one more win right before the finals, and it would have made for a more even win distribution in the finale, which I always love. She had the best verse, one of the best runways, and the absolute best performance look. She took the note for Angeria and crawled on the catwalk looking as fierce as she ever has. I mean, this episode was Daya's, and I definitely was shocked when Camden took it, mostly because I felt like she didn't need it. Camden had proven time and time again what a force she was in the competition. She won a challenge with a part she didn't want in the musical. She got over her timid nature. She became the second straight contestant of the season when she revealed her crush on Blake Lively. I mean, she had nothing to prove in this final episode, whereas Daya's storyline felt like she still did. It would have been nice to see Daya get that second win. Bosco definitely gets saved from the bottom here, mostly because I think they wanted a top five anyways. And at this point, they had more faith in Willow slaying a telephone lip sync than Bosco. 
And even though she did get to get another challenge win after being saved by the chocolate, it just kind of would have diminished the importance of the chocolate twist if she didn't make it to the finale, if she didn't go all the way. So I understand why they saved Bosco here, because she probably would have been ate alive by Willow in a telephone lip sync. But also, am I crazy? Or was telephone possibly supposed to be a song in the Lollapalooza? And one of the less dancey songs like Don't Let Go or Respect was supposed to be the final lip sync song. It just doesn't make sense to give the girls like a bucking number when they're in gowns. I mean, Telephone would have worked so much better for the Lala Perusa, but hey, like Jasmine could have demolished that. So I absolutely loved this finale format and I hope they keep it forever. This is so much more akin to what the queens do out on the road making their own numbers with props and dancers and budgets. While all the queens did incredible, the two who had the best performances were clearly Camden and Willow. They were also the two fan favorites going into the finale, so everything worked out very nicely. Willow also destroys the final lip sync. Camden did well too, but recreating her iconic reveal moment I think was a mistake. I get the appeal of referencing one of your biggest moments on the show, but at the finale, you should be bringing out new tricks, showing off the tools you still have in your arsenal, but have been waiting to bring out until now. Willow had smart reveals and huge energy. I was so happy to see Willow Pill take the crown. Both her and Camden were the two most consistent queens of the season, but Willow just had this like extra little something that set her apart from everyone else around her and everyone we've seen hold the crown. Overall, while there were a lot of production tampering, I think everything worked out in the end. The rightful final two, the rightful winner, lots of fun runways, lip syncs, fights, even like little moments. I, I think of Daya asking what the word for like being gay in the woods is and Willow saying hiking. I mean, Drag Race struck gold with this cast and they managed to stick the landing making it one of the most consistent, fun, fierce, entertaining, and hilarious seasons of all time. Just please, for season 15, no more chocolate bars ever! I want to thank you so much for sticking around to the very end of this video. This is a very long video, and it's been a very long season, so I'm just happy that we're at the finish line and it all was worth it in the end. Now, I still have a couple more Season 14 videos coming out and some other projects coming out as well. So I'm very happy to continue to pump out some Season 14 tea. And I'm also very excited to start talking about some all winners. I mean, we have so much Drag Race going on this year, and I'm just so excited for all of it. If you are not already, I would love it if you would subscribe. I'm trying to get to 50k by the end of summer, so like, help me make that a fantasy, a French vanilla fantasy. Also, comment below, what do you think was the most rigged moment of this entire season? I would like to know. Here are the links to all of my social medias, as well as my beautiful, amazing, wonderful patrons. Thank you so much for your support. I appreciate it always. It has been such a long day solving the mystery of like what I want for dinner tonight. Like, oh my gosh, I'm like starving and I just don't want to cook. Oh wait, I think a dragonfly just flew past. I'm just trying to get a $1,000 check and can you blame me? All right, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.